Several years ago when the film of the story originally appeared, I saw it and thought that this was certainly going to be an operatic material that I could use. Then I read the story and realized that the story is much better actually than the film. Uh, shortly after that, uh, Gerard Mortier heard of the interest that I had in this project and uh, when he was coming to the New York City Opera, commissioned it for the New York City Opera. That of course is a sad story. Uh, that organization is no more and he is here in Madrid now and has commissioned the work for Madrid. Uh, after we made the decision to, uh, to go ahead with the opera, we looked around for a librettist and found to our great satisfaction that Annie Pru herself would write the libretto, which she did. Uh, that was that. I worked with her for a week or so uh, in Wyoming in the mountains or near the mountains that uh, are the model for Brokeback Mountain. And then we communicated by email mostly, back and forth, drafts one way or another, and with very little problem at all. In fact, a, a delightful co collaboration. Uh, we achieved a libretto, or she, I should say, achieved it with some suggestions of mine. And then I composed the music, and here we are. The opera is very different. Uh, the tone of the opera, I think, is, is very different. It emphasizes the, the difficulty, in fact, the impossibility of the love between these two characters. Of course, that's present in the film as well. But the film is a much softer, much longer treatment. And in one particular respect, the film uh, deviates from the real situation uh, in rural Wyoming, for example, or in the mountains there. The film is uh, filled with beautiful cinematography that, uh, that shows a, a welcoming, beautiful, beckoning landscape. Well, uh, the truth of the matter is that in Wyoming, Yes, the landscape is beautiful, but it is also very threatening, very dangerous. It, it, it is very easy to be killed in these mountains by weather, by avalanche, by landslides, or by other people for that matter. So uh, in that sense, the opera, uh, which is much closer to the original story, uh, I think takes a, uh, takes a view which is much more realistic of the environment or the surroundings in which these two characters um, first meet and eventually spend uh, 20 years of their lives? Well, that's a difficult question to answer because uh, I can't tell you that I did this and then I did that to produce these effects or sensations or reactions in the people who hear and see the opera. All I can say is that I absorbed these contradictions, this difficulty, this uh, inability of the two of them to finally come to, to a real uh, life together, but yet uh, remaining essentially faithful to each other over a period of 20 years, although each of them, of course, is burdened with an ordinary family as well. Uh, all I can say is that I absorbed this and I hope that the music I wrote uh, has something to do with these with these questions and will have some, somehow counterpoint and underlie and express the contradictions and conflicts that you are speaking of. No, I don't have models in that sense. I have, of course, favorite composers, but if I list them, they just become a, a catalog with a particular American flavor, I should say, of the uh, great composers of the last century. So, of course, there's Stravinsky, Schoenberg, Varez, uh, and uh, then, uh, and uh, and the, the others that come immediately to mind, and uh, Elliot Carter, of course, who was an old friend of mine, as well as, uh, as was Varese, for that matter, and uh, Milton Babbitt and, and others. Uh, those are not models, but they are influences, because now, unfortunately, I'm 75, so my influences are from a long time ago. Now, about Wozzeck, I should say, perhaps, certainly a work I love, of course, as we all do, but I don't know that there's any direct influence. But the reference you make to Moses and Aaron is interesting because it is I who brought this up in the first place. Because uh, the situation of Moses in Moses and Aaron is that he has, of course, the idea, the word, but he can't express it. So he must use his brother, Aaron, to, uh, to be the public voice and to express it. And that's why 
as the opera now ends at the end of the first act, where he says, "Oh, word that I lack." Now, Ennis is the character of Ennis is is not, he's not a prophet; he's no such thing. But he also has the same problem. He cannot express himself. Initially, at the beginning of the opera, he can hardly speak. He just nods or gestures, and then sometimes he shouts. Then he begins to talk a little bit, and it's very, very short, very fragmentary. And he doesn't really sing. It's kind of an expression that he, that he uses uh, at the beginning and for quite a long time after. But as the opera proceeds, as the 20 years unfold, he sings more and more until finally uh, he sings all the time. His final monologue in the opera, which you might almost consider an aria if it weren't such a dated term, uh, comes after D Jack is dead. And this is when he is finally able to express his complete feelings, his love and all that. But of course, it's too late, which is, that is the essential tragedy of the opera. But this is what I meant by uh, making a connection with Moses and Aaron. Because Moses is in the same position, although of course his mission is entirely different. It's public and, and redemptory and whatever else you want to call it. Whereas Ennis is just trying to survive. And for him, of course, the tragedy and the irony is that he, the one who couldn't express himself until it's too late, he is the one who survives. He goes on living his life, uh, no doubt. Sounds like that heart is saying, free, you are free. Up here we are free. It's in two acts, uh, each of which has 11 scenes. And it essentially chronicles the first meeting of the protagonists of the two characters. It shows, as time goes on, for, of course, their initial, their initial involvement as they herd sheep on the mountain. It shows then uh, little vignettes of their normal, so to say, family life with their wives and children, uh, and then proceeds through that to to the uh, to a final conflict uh, between the two of them, which seems to be resolved, uh, which is then followed by uh, Ennis discovering uh, indirectly by mail essentially the death of Jack, and then his attempt to to reconcile his uh, his feelings with the with the resulting distress. So that is essentially how it is put together. No, uh, there are there are uh, not light motifs, I should say, but there are uh, harmonic materials, specific pitches, in fact, that uh, refer to the two characters and one that also refers to, uh, to the mountain, which is in the background. So there, there, is, there is that element. And it, of course, uh, uh, produces or exerts a unifying force on the entire composition. There are also other uh, items of machinery in the composition which I will not burden you with, which are not very, maybe interesting for me or for other composers, but not interesting for the public in general. But I think it holds together. Well, it's, it's an interesting question. In one sense, you could say that a problem, uh, that, a, that a work that has uh, two male characters, or for that matter, two women only, uh, might become uninteresting to listen to. But I never found that to be the case. There are some scenes in the opera, particularly one in the first act uh, that has only women and only essentially high, uh, high pitches, uh, that I introduced in order to provide a contrast. There is some of that. But a problem like this only exists if you make it a problem. And I have made a specialty over the course of my of my uh, composing career, 
uh, to write music for many different kinds of uh, combinations, which might seem uh, difficult or unusual, but they seem to come out all right. For example, one comes to mind a piece of mine for double bass tuba and bass trombone. I think when you hear it, you don't say to yourself, oh, there's all those low instruments, why can't I have some high notes? If you compose properly, the problem disappears. Uh, and in this case, in the case of this opera, also I have been uh, gi given a, a wonderful text by Annie Prue, which is very clear uh, and very concise, as a libretto must be. There are no extra words, there's no, there's no long time where you have to have to spend explaining background or other things of that sort. And uh, this means that the clear projection of the text uh, is of paramount importance. This is an old story, of course, but uh, it's of paramount importance. And when it is clearly projected, when the text is clearly projected, then the question of who is doing the projecting, whether it's a tenor, baritone, or a soprano, becomes, I think, much less important. The chorus, the chorus are furies. They appear only once, very briefly, in the second act, just after Ennis has learned of the death of Jack. Uh, he's in public, he's just gotten a, a, a piece of mail, a postcard returned, which says, deceased on it, that's the postcard from Jack, and he now realizes he's dead. This is shattering, he had no warning whatever. Uh, so he, uh, our stage directions say, if they are followed uh, in the production, uh, say that he, uh, He's so shocked he drops, the, he drops the postcard. The wind blows it away. He had go, has to crawl on his knees to, to uh, get it back, to find it. And meanwhile, the people of the town, he's in the public, public square, the people of the town are, what is the matter with him, they're asking. What's wrong with him? Who is he? Uh, and then they begin to say, oh, he's, uh, he's from the Del Mar family. They're... they're uh, uh, their, his parents were killed in a car wreck years ago, and they, they starved with this. He's difficult. He always fights with people. They're making these nasty, totally unsympathetic comments, and they follow him around as he is looking for a telephone to call, uh, to call Jack to try and see somehow he may still be alive. And then when he has a subsequent conversation with the, with the, the wife of Jack, now, her, now his widow, uh, they are, gather around him like this, and they are making sarcastic comments or repeating what he says in a very unsympathetic sympathetic way. Uh, they are, I suppose you might say, a manifestation of his mind in a certain sense, a, an external form of the kind of conflict which he, uh, which he has never been able to resolve. It's that kind of thing. But the fact that they are there for such a short time I think is very important. They don't have any other role except to appear briefly as furies and then they disappear. If one works hard, one is likely to feel tired, but the writing an opera is no different from anything else. And in fact, in the case of this work, I was obliged to interrupt it once or twice to write some other pieces to meet some other deadlines which I had. But I think the total span of time was perhaps four years or so, something like that. But that doesn't mean four years to write this piece. I think if I had done nothing but work on this uh, at all, it would have been perhaps two years. Uh, I'm not enormously fast, but I'm not very slow either. Uh, I take a very, uh, how should one put it, a, a neutral point of view. I simply write what is in front of me. Uh, it's like uh, being invited to a dinner. Uh, and one doesn't say, when the host provides the food, one doesn't say, oh, I don't want that, give me something else. So I take the projects as they come. Of course, 
a lot of the time I initiate them. So uh, I do things that I want to do. Now this particular project, of course, has a great resonance uh, in the world at large, and it, and it affected me personally very, very strongly. So it's something I really wanted to do. And then the only questions after that are practical ones. Uh, yes, if one has written 2,000 measures of music or 600 pages of score, uh, I suppose one might take a rest afterwards, but my rest usually involves turning to another project. So I wasn't particularly tired, and I didn't feel as if I had undertaken an enormous project that was going to be much more demanding than, than uh, a small piece of chamber music, because I saw what it would be on the stage. Well, the, the original story, and indeed uh, almost all of Annie Prue's work, uh, features that kind, kind of, of one, how should one say, little literary packages, short scenes uh, that accomplish a certain thing, and then there is a break, and then another, another scene or another uh, item of information is provided. So, uh, and the story is that way, and the revisions that she made in, in making the libretto are that way. So that uh, would make it a natural matter for a, a, an opera, a stage work of several scenes. The division into two acts, I suppose, is mostly convenient. It's not an essential structure. But I must say, the instrumental interludes do have a role. Of course, they are to some extent, uh, they, because there's such a difference between this scene and this scene that one needs to have something between. Yes, there's that. And to some extent, they are a commentary on what is going on. But they also uh, have a, a role of punctuating the action in the following way. As the work proceeds, they become shorter, and there are fewer and fewer of them until in the second act there are hardly any. And when they are, they're very, they're very brief. They're not these kind of Straussian tone poem things of th all of three minutes that they are in the first act. Well, all of the functions that you mentioned are present. Uh, I think it's very important always to give singers support in the form of doubling notes. So there's a lot of that, not all the time, of course but in certain critical places where I think it may be hard for them to hear what they have to do, I will provide support in the, in the orchestra in one way or another, sometimes very obviously, sometimes uh, very subtly. Uh, there also is the element, as you say, of commentary, and that, that occurs from time to time. Sometimes it's, uh, you might almost say, onomatopoeia, that is to say, the orchestra making a sound which is like something that is going on, or is a comment on something that is going on. Uh, and then, as I mentioned earlier, of course, there are these harmonic materials that, that apply or refer to different characters or different situations which are present as well. So all of those things are there. As for kind of Mozartian irony that you sometimes find, I'm not sure that that has um, a, a very significant role in this work, principally because the two characters, and one must always remember this, the two characters are very undeveloped, very un, as, as human beings, very unsophisticated, and with no real uh, horizon. There's no large horizon in the world for them. Uh, I remember at one point uh, someone saying to me, well, if they have this attraction and they want to do this and everyone around them is so against it or it would be fatal if they reveal this, why don't they just go someplace uh, where they can be free? Go to San Francisco, do everything fine. The point is, these are people who can't imagine doing something like that. They are not aware of possibilities. Both their time, the time in which this opera takes place, which is from 1963 to 1983, and their place, rural Wyoming, completely confines their sense of possibilities. So it's very important to understand that. And given that, uh, the idea of mocking them with funny noises in the orchestra, I think would be brutal and, uh, and would take away from the essential tragedy of the piece. Uh, one has to be careful of that kind of thing. It's very easy to make fun of people who are defenseless, and I wouldn't want to do that. There is very little ensemble music in this because of the nature of the story and the, uh, uh, and, and the, the need to 
project the text. There is a little something, the three women in the, uh, in the first act, where uh, the daughter who is going to marry uh, 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 Ennis and her mother and a sales lady in the, in the, uh, are in the shop for trying to, uh, where they're trying to buy a wedding dress. There is a little of that, a little trio there. There is, of course, the chorus, which we spoke of earlier, and uh, one or two other places. But an ensemble in which people stand up and sing a complex kind of, uh, kind of fabric, that uh, vocal fabric in which different texts, different words are being done simultaneously, is not really appropriate here. It's much, the piece is much more direct and much simpler in that sense. I should. I, I, I should say that I, I don't want to, uh, want to forget that. Last year, just about a year ago, uh, we were lucky enough to have a visit here to look at the theater. And I have to say, it, of course, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. And I can't imagine a better physical location for, um, for this piece, or indeed for any other, frankly. So I, I, do want to, I do want to say how much I appreciate the fact that our being able to have this first uh, production here. You know, when one comes from, you come from the United States where these the enormous barns that are two or three or four times too big for anything, really, even the largest kind of uh, production, let alone classical opera, whether it's Mozart or the Italians in the 19th century. The houses are all, those houses are all too big, I think. So it is wonderful to have a house like this where the orchestra itself is so intimate and then the rings go up, but everyone can feel in contact with the stage because it's not so far away. So th that, is, uh, th that is something that I'd like to put on the record, as we say. Can I talk to Jack? I need to talk to Jack. Please. Please, please. And the Stelma, his fishing buddy, we're old friends. Please, put him on. I'm sorry to tell you this, but Jack passed away in July. An accident. He wouldn't notify his friends. There is no harm to get in touch. What happened? How? I seen him in May, and he was beautiful. Well, I don't know. It, 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 it is a lot of very active music, but you have to remember that the, these, the protagonists are young. Uh, we meet them first when they are uh, herding sheep on a mountain. Well, thank heavens we don't see the sheep. Uh, that's, not a, that's not an issue. But they, uh, they have active lives. Uh, they, in their lives, they, they move around. They do a lot of physical labor and all of this, so that seems perfectly appropriate. Uh, and there is conflict. They fight once, and uh, uh, there are arguments, of course, all, during the course of the piece. So there's plenty of room for the agitato, and uh, that, I think, is why it's there. But everything, uh, I hope, uh, that I have composed is in the service of the drama, an ancient idea, uh, many, many centuries old, and I just continue it. <laughs> 